And as I said, I'm so glad that you are at Glory today. Did you miss me? I missed you. I haven't been here for a couple of weeks, so it's good to be back. If you don't know, my family and I, we went to Branson, Missouri, and, and went to vacation there, and uh, had a good time. And I was reminded, uh, my parents go to Branson three, four weeks out of the year. They have a timeshare there. And uh, so we go and we worship the same place each year with them. It's at Hamner's Theater, if you're familiar with him. And uh, he's one of the uh, illusionists, entertainers, and but he's also an ordained uh, Baptist pastor. And so my parents like him, and so we always go there. And, and, and it's a great setting because it's a theater, but I was reminded as I was sitting there in this theater, we have such a beautiful view when we sit here and worship, don't we? There's not too many churches. You can look at the cross and then see the weather and, and all that God is doing outside. That's, that's a, a wonderful, beautiful thing. But as I said, it was a great vacation, but I'm glad to be back here today. I'm excited. We're kicking off a new sermon series. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Haggai. How many of you can turn right now to Haggai? Anybody? One. Yeah? In, in, in my Bible, yeah, Steve, yeah, the phone. That's the right, that's the right answer. In my Bible, and I guarantee yours is not the same, it's page 887. And if you're not familiar with Haggai, that is the book you're looking for. One page. One page in my Bible, anyhow. So, we're going to be in that, and we're going to be in that for four weeks. We're going we're gonna to make one page of Scripture speak to us for four weeks. And I promise you, it's going to be good. And not only is it going to be speaking to us for four weeks, this is kind of a setup for where we're going to get to in the fall. This fall, my plan is we're going to go through the book of Esther. And this book corresponds with that. And so they, they kind of dovetail with one another. So what we're talking about today as far as the, the time and the people is going to have some commonality when we get to this other book in the fall. So I'm really excited. And I want to give you a little bit of a, a background, kind of open things up to get us going today so you understand what this book is about and where this book comes from. Um, if you're like me, this is one of those books in your Bibles you probably don't have very many highlights in there. It's like one of those really clean pages, right? As, as I look through my Bible, I didn't have any underlines, and I'm an underliner, right? So, so I, I like to write my Bibles. This one, nothing. I know I've read this book. I had to write paper about it in seminary, but uh, you just don't spend a whole lot of time in Haggai. It's, it's, a, it's a neat little book, though, and we're going to dig into it. And it's a prophetic book that was written um, quite a long time ago. Um, and... Despite that, I would argue that what God was speaking to the people of Israel 2,600 years ago is still absolutely applicable to our lives today. So, so I hope that this will be a, a redemptive time for us over these next few weeks as we, we go through this, seeing what the Lord had to say to the people of Israel 2,600 years ago, and then translating that to what it means to us today. Now, as I said, I want to kind of jump back a little bit and give you a little bit of the backstory. It's a small book, and I want you to understand what's going on here. It, it's literally only two chapters long. It's a total of all of 38 verses, right? So if you want to go home and read this after church, um, it'll be done before you can get a pot of water to boil, right? It, it's quick. It, it's real quick. Um, but as you read through it, you will see there's four clear movements in this book. And, and you need to know in this backstory, um, for you to understand this book at, at this time in, of Israel, as we jump into it, you need to know that this is 586 B.C. And at this time, Israel, the nation of Israel, the physical nation of Israel, was already divided into two. If you're not familiar, you've got Israel and Judah, right? And, and the, the kingdom had already been divided, and the southern portion of Israel had already, at this point, been conquered by the Assyrians about a hundred years prior. So, so they had been conquered in the southern half of Israel. The northern half at the time was, was still living free. Um, but at this time then, in 586 B.C., uh, they become conquered by the Babylonians. Um, the nation of Israel had fallen into idolatry. Um, and this is part of the judgment of God for their waywardness. I, we, I talk about this all the time when I talk about the Old Testament. When you look at the Old Testament, it's this roller coaster ride of, of they kind of get moving in the right direction spiritually as a nation, and then idolatry. And then God rebukes them, and they slowly begin to dig out of the hole they made, and then idolatry. And it's just, it's this pattern over and over and over. You, you read the book in hindsight, and you look at them and go, you dummies, learn from your mistakes, right? But we have to be cautious to be too critical of them because we look at our own lives and go, you dummy, you keep sinning, learn from your mistakes, right? 
we have a lot in common. So we can't be overly critical and can't be too quick to judge them because a lot of times we fall into the same, same problems. But they, they had fallen into idolatry. They had ceased to worship God. And God had promised them, if you quit worshiping me, you're going to be enslaved by some captors. And so that's exactly what happened. The Babylonians come in. They take them captive. And not only do they take them captive, but here's the bad deal. They, they take them captive, and then they haul them off 900 miles away. So imagine if today, like an invading army came into Aiken County, rounded us all up, packed us into trains, and shipped us all to Cleveland, Ohio. How many is excited for that? <laughs> Nobody wants to go to Cleveland? Me neither. One of us, yeah, one. Okay, must have family or something, right? <laughs> but, but that's kind of what it's like. like. Like, they all get shipped off to Cleveland, Ohio. They, they get taken captive, every single one of them. And, and they live there for the next 50 years. So, so this northern kingdom gets shuffled away about 900 miles away. They're, they're under Babylonian rule. They can no longer, because of this, worship their God freely. Of course, they can't go to the temple because the temple's back in Israel. And not only that, the temple was destroyed, right? They, they, they destroyed the temple when the Babylonians came in. And they, they, they ruined it and, and just broke it down all the way to the ground. There was not a stone left standing one on top of the other. The temple of Solomon wrecked. And it lay there, this, this, this building that was one of the wonders of the world, right? This, this splendor, the majesty, the glory. This is the place where the Israelite people went to worship their God. And now, there's none of it left. They burned it. They destroyed it. And Israel is held captive. So we fast forward then about 50 years into this captivity, where God finally intercedes. Enough is enough. So in 539 B.C., the Persians come in, and they conquer the Babylonians. And they kind of clean house, and, and uh, Israel, as a result of that, becomes captive to Persians rather than the Babylonians. And this is important because the Persians, you see, they're a little more lax. They're a little more liberal in their policies of the people that they govern. They, they, they tolerate a plurality of worship. They're willing to allow the Israelites, to allow the Jews to worship their God if they want to. And so the King Cyrus, the king of Persia, issues a decree. It says, you, you can go ahead and I guess go back to your old gods, as they would have called them at the time. But not only does he say that, but then he says, you know, there's really no reason for you to be living over here in Cleveland, Ohio. Why don't you go back to Aiken? So, so he, he allows them, if they want, to move back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. He gives them that freedom. And now it's a 900-mile journey back. Most, you would think, would say, yeah, that's our homeland. That's where God made all these promises. The land of flowing milk and honey, right? We should get there. But if you read your Old Testament, and as we get into Esther this fall, you'll see this more, you'll know that that isn't actually what happened. About 50,000 Jews say, yeah, we're going back to Jerusalem and Israel. But the rest of them kind of look around and go, I don't know. I got a house. I already planted the tomatoes and they're starting to grow. I'm not sure I want to leave them. Beans are going to be coming. I think we'll stay here, right? Which was a mistake. They, they were not supposed to do that. God was very clear in his commands to the Israelite people. But they just kind of take the easy way out and go, eh, I think we're going to hang out here. But at least 50,000 of them do return back. And when they go back, uh, they go back to rebuild the city uh, of Jerusalem. And they go back with basically three different major goals. And they're covered by the different prophets here in the Old Testament. You find in Haggai, as well as in Zechariah, a focus on the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah, if you've read Nehemiah, you'll know this, but Nehemiah, that whole book focuses on the rebuilding of the city and the walls surrounding the city. And then the book of Ezra, which is also a very interesting book. The book of Ezra talks about rebuilding the people of God. So you've got the, the, the temple, the city, and the people all being rebuilt now at 539 B.C. And, and it kind of gives us all these different angles between uh, Zechariah, Haggai, Ezra, Nehemiah, as well as Esther. All of these books kind of all overlay one another at the same time, same people, same kind of place. Now, particularly in the book of Haggai, he's going to speak to his people, God is. And, and they, are, they arrive finally in 536 B.C. It took a little while for them to get there, to get everything sorted out, to get moved. And they begin, as they get back to Jerusalem, they survey things and they see 
just total annihilation and destruction. And so they go, okay, God has sent us back and we're supposed to rebuild the temple. Let's rebuild the temple. So they get to work rebuilding the temple. They get the foundation laid and they start working hard at that. You know, and of course, as you read and you see in scripture, but if you built a house or a garage or something, you know, the foundation, that's key. If you don't get that foundation right, all the rest is going to be off. The building won't be strong. And so they, they do a good job on this foundation. But as they finish up the foundation, you see there's this problem. There's this group of people that they have this strong hatred for. These Samaritans, right? You've heard of those folks, right? The Samaritans. The Samaritans begin to persecute the Israelites. The Samaritans basically, this is roughly what happens. The Samaritans see the Israelites come back to, to Jerusalem. And they don't like the Israelites. And so they start writing, they start a letter writing campaign of sorts. They start writing to the Persian leaders. They start saying to these Persian leaders, Hey, if you let these people come back and start worshiping their God... They're going to be a problem. They're going to be a pain in your rear end. You shouldn't let them do this. Don't let them rebuild. Don't let them worship their God. You're, just, you're going to have endless headaches if you do this. It's going to be anarchy. They're going to rebel against you if you let them worship their God. So if you're not going to stop them, we will. That's basically what the Samaritans said. And so the Samaritans start to persecute the Israelites. Um, they, they, they start to interfere. They start to cause problems. They start to threaten them. And so as this persecution begins, this, this 50,000 person remnant that had come back, after they get the, the, the foundation temple put together, they're scared by this. There's a lot more Samaritans than there are Israelites. And so they kind of they retreat a little. And they retreat effectively for, for 15 years of Scripture. And so for 15 years after they arrive in Jerusalem, they get the foundation laid, but for 15 years, no more work is done. They, 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 they don't go back to the temple to, to build it back up anymore. They, they, they let the Samaritans kind of scare them off. And so God's temple is not restored. You see, the people who had been redeemed and released to go back and do this work, instead, they go back and spend this 15 years focusing on themselves because they were afraid. So 15 years later, what happens is God sends the prophet Haggai. Haggai comes in to, to give a word to the nation of Israel. And he's going to give four short messages, as I mentioned, in, in, in this book. And we're going to focus on the very first one today. And the first one's focus is talking about kingdom principles and kingdom priorities. Okay, Having this as your priority. God's kingdom. And, and Effectively, Haggai is going to say, God did not send us back. God did not send you back. God did not free you from the Babylonians and from the Persians. He didn't send you back here just to focus on yourself and neglect His kingdom. So then he challenges them and he says, Hey, instead, your job is to pour yourself into His kingdom. That's why He saved you. Did you hear that? God didn't free you just to focus on yourself. Pour into His kingdom if you've been free. So then let's jump in there. We're going to be at Haggai 1.1. And if you want to follow along, you can. We'll throw some scripture up on the screen here. And uh, we're going to just dig in. And the first thing I want to point out as we do this, as we look at Haggai 1.1, is Haggai is an interesting little book in that. You know, we have all of this scripture. We have 66 books of the Bible. And most of those books of the Bible, we know approximately when it was written but not with a lot of specificity we don't know on like was it a tuesday that this was written right however in the book of haggai we have some markers some indicators that that make it abundantly clear exactly when this book was written so so literally um, as we look at the first part it says in the second year of darius the king in the sixth month and on the first day of the month so, so quite literally, scholars have done the kind of working back to this date. This is August 29th, 520 B.C. This is one of the very few spots in the Bible you can go, it was that day. Okay? Just, just an interesting little side note of the scripture. But we know exactly when this took place. And then it says, The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai to the prophet Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah. Zerubbabel is, is the political leader. 
Okay, you need to understand he's a political ruler at this time. When the Israelites were captured by the Babylonians 50 years prior, Zerubbabel was the guy, and actually he would have been a young guy at the time, but he was the guy who was in line to be the next king of Israel. But the Babylonians came and kind of ruined that day. So he never got to be king. He was captured. He was taken into Babylonian captivity and eventually under the Persians. But he gets to return, at least, to be a political leader. He gets to come back to be a ruling, a governor of sorts. Not a king, but a governor at least. A governor, right? Uh, if you listen to British things. And if you look at the book of Matthew 1, you will find an interesting little note. In Matthew 1, Zerubbabel is in the lineage of Jesus. That's right in Jesus' genealogy. So through this man, the Messiah would come. Um, and now he's come back to, to lead his people, uh, to lead them in this project of rebuilding the temple. And from a political leader standpoint, um, he's there working, but then there's also another guy at the time. It's Joshua. It says, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So you've got a political leader and you've got a religious leader leading the Israelites. And between the two of them, they're there to do this work. But as it said in Scripture, for 15 years, they just kind of floated on autopilot. Then it comes to verse 2. And what you get in verse 2 there is you begin to get God's perspective on the excuses that the people give as to why they were not rebuilding God's temple. So they've sat around for 15 years, basically doing nothing on the temple. And this is their excuse. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say, The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. That's their excuse. What does God call His beloved nation? As you read through the Old Testament, He says, I am your God and you are my people. Right? You are my people. But notice what He says here. Do you say, see that? He says, not my people say the time has not come. He says, these people. Right? Did you catch that? An important little nuance. A little tip. Like if you come home... This, this, this happens. I'm a parent, right? I've got an eight-year-old son. And if I come home and, and uh, walk in the house, you know, and then, of course, my, my wife and son, they adore me. So they meet me at the door and they hug, you know, right? Come on, let's be real. Um, they, they like me. That's uh, good enough. But uh, <laughs> they love me. I'll take that. But uh, I come in the house, right? And then you hear, Do you know what your son did? <laughs> Not our son. Your son, when, when you hear that, that exclusive like that, right? When you hear that kind of language in your life, you know, trouble. Nothing good comes after. Do you know what your son or what your child did today? Nothing ever good comes following those words. And that's what God's doing right here in Scripture. He says, these people, they are still His people. He is still their God. He's still in covenant with them, but... He's pointing out in Scripture, they're knuckleheads, right? He's not pleased with them. And so their excuse is, eh, it's not time yet, you know? Instead of saying, no, we were afraid of the Samaritans, they're just like, nah, it's not time yet, we're not going to build. No, you were chickens. That, that was a true answer. Then we get to verse 3, it says, the, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And, and, and notice there, if you want to circle it in, in both in verse 2 and verse 4, the word time, um, those two connect with one another. And it's because this is God, literally, this is sarcasm. God has put sarcasm in the Bible. God, God created humor. And in Scripture, you'll find all sorts of little bits and pieces of funny little things. And, and here is God giving us a little sarcasm. This word time. Because they're using time as their excuse. He says, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while the house, the temple, lies in ruin. So God's going, let me get this straight, Israelites. You're trying to tell me the time to rebuild the temple hasn't come yet. Right? It's like your child saying, it's not time to clean my bedroom. <laughs> Say what? Right? How would that go over at your house? That, that would be an interesting conversation in my house. So God, it's not time yet for us to rebuild the temple that you told us to rebuild. 
And, and, and God is saying, let me get this straight. You're saying the time hasn't come yet, the time that I told you has already come? You're telling me it's too hard, that it's too difficult, that you can't commit to doing the Lord's work, but you feel like it, it is time to work on your own home. Huh. See, the word that jumps out in this passage that gives us context for this whole book, in fact, is this word in verse 4 there. It's the word paneled. And you know, if we live here in Minnesota, if I want some paneling, I can run over to Brainerd or I can go to the lumber store here in town. They've got paneling and I can get cedar paneling and I can probably get all kinds of different paneling and make the house look great, right? But have you ever seen pictures of Israel? Was it forested? Is there a lot of trees there to make panels out of? Not unless you were slicing rock. There's an abundance of rock. There's lots of gravel. There's a, quite a bit of sand. Not much as far as trees go, right? And God is saying, somehow you've paneled all your houses. You found time to gussy them up real nice. You've been going over to places like Lebanon. You've been taking all this time off, right? So imagine if you're a construction company and your employee calls in and says, oh, it's not time to work yet. And you go over to his house and knock on his door to see why he didn't come to work and he's in there paneling his house instead of working for you. This is effectively what's happening to God here. He says, you're going over to these other places you're going over to Phoenicia. You're going over to Lebanon. You're going over there. You're chopping down the trees. You're, you're cutting it. You're slabbing it. You're making these beautiful panels out of it. Then you're putting it on some wagons or some carts. You're dragging it all the way back to Jerusalem. So then you put it up on your walls. But you don't have time to build the temple. It's not time to build the temple. What, what, the temple. I told you to go build the temple. What, what do you mean it's not time to clean your room? Right? That's kind of what God is saying to them here. He's saying, you're telling me it's not the right time to do what I told you to do? Can you imagine how incredulous God must be? As a parent, I'd be like, I can't believe I'm hearing this. Now if I was God, and I'm not, believe me, I'm not. I'd only imagine just God going, I can't believe what I'm hearing. This is why he uses sarcasm here. Because otherwise I think he would have smote them. Fire, lightning. I would have been angry if I was God. It's a good thing I am not God. But he says to them, you are willing to spend all your time and all this effort and all this labor to go and build up your house. To protect your own comfort. To build up your own name. To make your own tiny little kingdoms. Meanwhile, my house is over here laying in ruins. It's in shambles. It's been burned to the ground. Yeah, you built a foundation, but that's it. You have completely neglected it. You've chosen for 15 years to ignore it and to focus on yourself. Something's not right with that. You see, they have the wrong priorities. And in Scripture, priority is always connected to the heart. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6? He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. He's saying, you can give me lip service all day long. You can tell me that you love me, that I'm your God, that I'm your king. But at the end of the day, if, if it doesn't show up in what you treasure, what you're investing your time, your treasure, your talents in, then it's just lip service, nothing more. So the issue here is, what God is relaying to these people is, the problem isn't all these other things, it's that they cared more about themselves than about God's kingdom. God is saying, I've redeemed you. I have brought you out of captivity. I gave you freedom to go home. I saved you, not so that you would come back and focus on yourself, but so that you would go and serve the king who liberated you. And he made the first priority Restoring the temple. He said, if you would go back and you would restore the temple, it would show me that genuinely you believe our God is God. That He is the God to be worshipped. Because you see, at this point in time, the Israelites, 
they were a laughing stock. All the surrounding nations had seen them being conquered, being taken away into slavery. And, and what that meant in that day and age, if you were conquered and you were taken into slavery, you've got the wrong God. Your God is weak. We can do the same to you anytime we want, right? And so the other countries, the Israelites are being weak, spineless, getting conquered. And the other countries around them are going, yeah, why would we want to worship that God? That God's a loser. He hasn't supported his people. So something is incredibly, incredibly out of place with the people of God. So here's what he does in verse 5. God basically calls a timeout, right? You ever been watching a basketball game? You see this in the NBA a lot. Like, a team will score 13, 14, 15 points. Just bam, 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 bam. It's just like a, uh, a, a freight train. Just gets rolling. And how do they try to stop that? Well, the coach will call a quick timeout. And just try to break that rhythm. Is there any magic in that timeout? No. But it it slows the play down. It it, it kind of a chance for everybody to catch your breath, reset, collect our thoughts. And that's effectively what God does. God says, timeout, I'm sending you Haggai. Timeout. He says, let's do a test for just a moment. Let's just look at what you've done for the last 15 years, Israel. He says, the last 15 years you've been pouring into your kingdom. You've been neglecting men. You've been pouring into your kingdom. How successful? How has that worked for you, Israel? God says. How has it worked when you've been neglecting me and pursuing yourself? (coughs) Says there if you're following along. Now therefore, thus is the Lord of the hosts. Consider your ways, Israel. You have sown much, but you've harvested little. God is saying, you've done a lot of work. You've planted a lot of seeds. You've been hoping that all these crops would come in so you'd have this bumper harvest, right? But what's happened? Nothing's really happened. He says, you eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. So both the grain and the grapes and the things that they've planted, they're not having any success here. You clothe yourself... Uh, but you're not warm. He, can you almost hear the mocking tone in God's voice? And he who earns wages puts them into a bag with holes. Right? This is a day and age at that time where they paid you in coin. They didn't have paper money. So you take all your coins, you stick them in a sack, and you're walking home with your week's wages, right? There's a hole in the bottom. They all start falling out. That's what God is saying. He's saying... You put all this that you thought you were investing into a bag that has a bunch of holes in the bottom and it's all leaking out. So God is saying, Israel, look at what has happened for the last 15 years. Are you trying to tell me it's not time to build my temple, but it's time for you to build your house. And as you have pursued yourself, as you have expended all of this energy and all this time, what sort of return have you gotten for it? I want to jump ahead to verses 9 through 11 here. Because God tells us specifically why they didn't have any success. He says, Israel, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, God says, I blew it away. God is saying, Israel, you had great ambitions and wishes for what life would be like when you get back here. And so you poured yourself into yourself for 15 years, only to have no fruit, basically, for 15 years. Only to have nothing come forth. And what little did come forth, God says? I just blew it away. Because you were doing the wrong thing for the wrong purposes. God, God says, Why have you not been successful? Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because my house lies in ruin. While each of you goes and busies himself or herself with their own business, with their own house. God is specifically telling the nation of Israel, the reason that you are failing, the reason nothing is working, is because you haven't been doing what you were supposed to do. You have the wrong priority. You've been totally committed to yourself instead of to me. And because of that, I have been committed 
to your failure. Interesting little passage, right? God is trying to get their attention. And I've said this before, maybe you're like me. I'm a lot like these people. Sometimes God has to get out the old 2 by 4 and just hack away at my head to get my attention. Because I don't always pay the best attention. That's what God is doing here. He's, he's grabbed the 2 by 4 and he's, bang, pay attention. Bang, pay attention. Right? They went into captivity. You would think, we're in captivity. we got to go back. We're going to do whatever God says. But no. They go back for a couple of days, do a little God's work, and then we're going to go work on this stuff over here instead. So God's promise, He gives this promise in Deuteronomy 28, happens in verse 10 here of Haggai. It says, Therefore the heavens above have withheld the dew, and the earth it's withheld its produce. You see, famine enters the land. All this work that they've done is for naught. They've been neglecting Him and pursuing themselves. And so in verse 11, God says, And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills and on the grain and the new wine and the oil and on what the ground brings forth, on man and on beast and on their labors. God is saying, you've pursued yourself. You've done whatever you've wanted. And that's the opposite of what you should be doing. Because you see, folks, God's economy is backwards from the world's economy. The world tells us, yeah, go focus on yourself. Go focus on building the biggest house, on getting the biggest bass boat, the fastest car, the nicest of this, the best of that. That's what the world wants us to focus on. That's what the world focuses on. If you watch advertisements, the advertisements we watch are based on not having enough, not looking good enough, or being afraid of something, right? A lot, a lot of advertisement is simply fear. Fear of missing out, fear of not having the best, or fear of something bad happening to you if you don't have this. That's what advertisement is if you pay attention. That's the way of the world. What is the most common commandment in the Bible? Does anybody know? Fear not. Fear not. As Christ followers, as the people of God, we are not to live in fear. The world constantly tries to create fear. The world is filled with chaos. And if we let the world dominate, we're going to be full of fear. But if our priority is on God's kingdom, the world is going to do what it's going to do, folks. But if our focus is on God's kingdom, if we have kingdom priorities, we have nothing to fear. God is calling them radically to come back to Himself. Salvation has liberated you. Not to indulge in narcissism. Not to be focused on self. Salvation has liber liberated us so that we can serve the King who freed us. That's the whole point of Romans 6. So God says here to His people, Consider your ways. You spent 15 years doing it your way. How is that working for you? Well, I'm looking around going, well, everything's dying. Our wells are going dry. Yeah, not so good, God. I don't know things are going like we want. He says, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you're naked, you're famished. How's it going? Working for yourself. So then the question, of course, then is, what is the answer to this? What do you do when you're in this situation? What do you do when you find yourself untethered from the Lord? When you find yourself either physically or spiritually empty? You're hungry, you're famished. What do you do? Well, the answer comes in verse 8. This is what the God of the people of Israel, our God, tells them. He says, Go up to the hills, bring wood, and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I might be glorified. In other words, he says, I want you to go to the very same place that you went and got all that paneling for your house. I want you to go and make some more paneling and bring it back and build the temple like I told you. Pour into my kingdom, he says, instead of into yourself. So that I might take pleasure in it. So that you'll take the focus off of yourself and put it on God's kingdom. And so as they do this, 
He says, instead of building your own kingdom, take that same energy, those same resources, and build it into mine. And when you do so, my pleasure will be felt. So this is to be an act of repentance by the Israelites. Seek first my kingdom. And then all the other stuff will take care of itself. God says, seek first the kingdom of God. So the question is, how do these people respond? We're going to wrap up with that. What did they do? What would you do in this situation? Well, verse 12 tells us exactly what they did. It says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all of the remnant of the people, obeyed. Fifteen years it took them. Obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Finally, obedience settles in. They heed the word of the Lord. But I want you to notice what they did first. Their very first act of obedience, it says, they obeyed, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Now when we talk about fearing the Lord, this is a different type of fear. This isn't fear of the world. This is a reverent fear. This is a fear of awe. This is coming before the cross. This is coming before your God going, you are God, the creator, the infinite, the creator of all the universe, the unimaginable, the amazing, the incredible, the perfect. And I am none of those. I am a broken man. I am a a broken woman. I don't have it all figured out. And I come before you Humbly, I come before you, God, taking your grace. I come before you, God, just thank you for your love, for loving me even though I couldn't earn it. Thank you, God, for giving me your son, Jesus, when I didn't deserve it. That's what it is to fear the Lord. That's what these people do. Their first act of repentance has nothing to do with their hands. It has to do with their hearts. They could have said, all right, boys, everybody go grab a shovel. We're going to go build the temple. But that would have been the wrong direction to go. Instead, their first act is obedience and fear of the Lord. So they repent. They have a heart change. And then in verse 13 it says, Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message and said, I am with you, declares the Lord. God has been working against them for 15 years because they weren't paying attention. Finally, that two by four up to the head gets their attention. Oh, you are God. Sorry, we had our priorities out of Iraq. Humbly they bow down. They repent. And when they repent, God says, I am with you. The moment your heart turns in its affections for the Lord, you instantly come into His good graces. That's what I love about the Great Commission, Matthew Matthew 28. It tells us, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So as you go out, as you go forth in obedience, as your heart is with God, you have the assurance that His presence goes with you. That God will never leave us or forsake us. And then it tells us in 14 that, that God continues to work. That the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they finally came then and worked on the house of the Lord. See, this is how it works, folks. Your heart changes, then your hands get involved. If God has transformed you, if God has radically changed you, then we see the fruit of that transition. You might say, Lord, Lord. You called out to me, Lord, Lord. But I didn't know you, right? Jesus says that. But 
if you were repentant, if you had this transformation, if indeed you were changed, then your hands get to work and the world can see the transformation, the power of Jesus Christ. And when He does that, when He has saved us and then put us on mission, our mission then is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Just as it was for the people then, it is today. Build up His church and edify God. Now, church is more than this building. The church is not, in fact, this building. The church is us. We are the church. When I say, I love my church, I'm not thinking of the speaker. When I say, I love my church, I'm not thinking of these microphone stands or this carpet or the roof. When I say, I love my church, I'm talking about you. We are the church. And if we have truly been moved by God, then we have an opportunity to learn from this story today just like Israel. Maybe things haven't been going like you wanted, spiritually. Right? Maybe we need to reset our priorities. That's the gospel. That's the good news. The good news is we get to have that chance that God doesn't abandon us. He doesn't forget us. He doesn't kick us to the curb when we, when we fail and we forget. No. God reaches down. He plucks us up. He dusts us off and gives us another chance each and every day. This is why we are here. This is why we were created. If you've ever read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, uh, I'm lukewarm on most of the book, but the very first sentence, pure gold. The very first sentence of The Purpose Driven Life says, it's not about you. It's simple, but profound. It's about God. And if we make it about God, then we will in return receive the benefits of all of the blessings He's intended for us. That's why we have been saved. That is the work that God is doing for us. That is the story of Haggai. Did you know that? How many of you have read that book before and said, Oh yeah, that's what the story is about. Well, that is what it's about. Let us be salt and light into the world and the community around us. Let us forsake vain personal pursuits that can so easily entangle us and let us be a people here at Glory Baptist Church that make our focus on trusting God in radical ways and then loving our culture in abundance and in joy. Discipleship and obedience, that is where it's at. That's what we are called to, each and every one of us, for His glory. Amen. Let's pray.